After graduating from college, I worked as a coach at a small family-owned sports complex for several years. I built a reputation for cultivating relationships with families and players and understanding the nuances of the in-person service experience. The complex was growing and the owner hired a director to expand it to greater heights. As soon as I met this new director, I knew something was off, but I couldn't grasp it. I have always been a voice that offered insight that helped shape the growth and direction of the sports complex. I championed ideas from the look of the complex to the daily activities, which become the cornerstones of our brain identity. This new director wanted to take the complex in a different direction. And my expertise and influence felt like a relic of the past. Uh, My first meeting with the new director to discuss the transition and the best way to take the complex from point A to point B. And so we can continue to grow in both customers and profit. And the meeting was a blur. He did not want to hear what I had to say. My voice was no longer influential in the decision making. I felt my once vibrant network within the complex suddenly disappear. I tried to add my perspective and emphasizes the importance of customer touch points. My suggestions were no longer received with the same esteem as before. As a result, I felt I was no longer a part of the team. The feeling of being adrift or lost was unsettling. I had always prided myself on the ability to adapt and still ahead of the curve, but this shift felt different. I watched my influence and control slowly fade away. A few months later, uh, several parents and players were frustrated with the direction, felt discontent, and expressed their desire to leave. I approached uh, the new director and the owner with a solution that would salvage everything and help rebuild the relationships with parents and players. But my voice was not heard, only met with skepticism. I felt It was not worth it to continue in this environment where I was taken for granted and could not be influential. So I stopped coaching at that sports complex. Maybe you have experienced something similar at home or at school or at work in your neighborhood. And probably asking questions like, how can you effectively influence these places where they reject your perspective or even oppose your values? Maybe you are at work or at school where most people are openly critical of your Christian values. You want to be influential with your faith, but don't want to be excluded if you hold traditional Christian beliefs. You might be wondering how you can navigate this without facing backlash from the people around you. Or perhaps you may want to maintain your godly principles around your friends. But these principles may clash with popular social trends. You wonder, how can you influence your friends while maintaining your Christian identity? As a parent, you might feel powerless when your children seem unreceptive uh, to your guidance. It can be a challenge to find ways to positively impact them, particularly when they perceive your beliefs and principles as old-fashioned and unimportant. And you might be passionate about advocating for something you believe in, 
but your message could be dismissed as extreme or irrelevant. Uh, you might find it challenging to balance your desire to influence public opinion with the reality of the social landscape. You might be asking yourself how to maintain influence without appearing out to be out of touch or judgmental. How are we to live within these tensions that we are constantly facing? If we are too quiet, our influence may fade. But if we are too vocal, we risk isolating those who oppose our values and losing potential opportunities to genuine influence. These situations reflect the tension of trying to maintain influence in a place or society that may reject or oppose your values. These situations also illustrates the practical or emotional and spiritual challenges of balancing faith in public life, highlighting the complexities of influence in the secular world. The tension point that I am struggling with, and maybe you might too, is how can we as Christians be influential when we are losing influence? How can we as Christians maintain our influence in a world where our impact is fading? Let's pray. God, we pray for this message. Lord, we ask that you help us understand this concept of influence so we can influence the people where you place us. So we can influence our society, our community, our city, our state, or our country. God, teach us today how to do that well. In Jesus' name. As Christians... We live in a tension within two worlds, the now and the not yet. We are in the world, but not of it or controlled by it. We live in the reality of this world with the hope for the next one to come. The New Testament authors who wrote and live within the reality of this world in light of the next one to come, this framework determined how they spoke about God's dealings in this world in light of the next one to come and how we should live in this world in light of the world to come. How do we practice this Christian living between the two worlds? How are we supposed to be in the world, but not of it? How do we live in the reality of this world with the hope for the next one to come? The apostle Peter tells us how in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 17. In this passage, Peter highlights two ways to live between the two worlds and be influential in this declining world. Uh, Peter encourages us to embrace two perspective as we live in this world. Firstly, we should recognize ourselves as foreigners in this world or in this society. And secondly, Peter emphasized that despite being foreigners, we are also citizens in this world or this country. Although we exist in a different kingdom, we are still present in this world. And therefore, we must behave responsibly as citizens, as believers in Christ. We are tasked to impact or influence the world. And these two perspectives serve as a means to showcase our influence in a declining society. We are foreigners, at the same time, 
citizens. These two perspectives should shape the way the world perceives us. So let's look at the first concept of foreigners. Peter says, Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners uh, to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then, even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. As foreigners in this world, we are called to live godly lives that can influence those around us. Uh, Peter urges us uh, to embrace a form of discipline that starts on the inside. If we aim to positively impact our declining society through evangelistic missions, living a life of integrity from within is essential. Uh, Peter refers to us as uh, temporary residents or foreigners, which highlighting that we do not belong to this world. Uh, Peter reminds us that to influence the world around us, we must keep away from worldly desires. What is Peter trying to communicate here? When we turn our lives to Christ, our souls are saved because our minds are cleansed, our hearts are transformed, and we are regenerated. And this results in a spiritual battle as worldly desires clash with the new spiritual life that God has given us. This is the struggle that Paul describes in Romans chapter 7, where he is, he is distressed to find himself in the midst of this spiritual battle. He says, And I know that nothing good lives in me. That is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. And Paul discovered this principle within himself. And I see this principle in me as well. It is the principle of God's truth, holiness, and purity fighting against my sinful nature. A uh, several Several years ago, I work in a school district where the school graded from A to F. If a school was an F school for a couple of years, the district zero based it. That means the school will start over from the ground up and every faculty and staff member could be reassigned. I was at a D school. And the district uh, sent a new principal to help the school improve before it became zero-based. The principal was a good friend of mine. He did a fantastic job at the school, but not everyone liked him because he held people accountable. <laughs> One of the teachers did not like him for whatever reason and, e and emailed a nasty letter to the whole school about the principal. When I read the email, I felt it was wrong of the individual to do this in a public setting. And I decided to respond to protect my friend. I drafted an email with careless words about the individual and got another friend to, who felt the same way I did to read it. And I got the thumbs up to send it. Then I decided to reply to all since the individual had sent it to all. Church, this was not my proudest moment. Not too long after I pushed the send button, there was a reaction throughout the school. The school was divided. 
My email caused people to pick a side. I poisoned the entire school with my careless words. People were being mean to each other. The individuals responded to my email and tried to justify things, and my friends responded, and the, the, the individual's friends responded. This thing was going back and forth, and it got out of hand. Oh, by the way, I was a Christian then, and people knew I went to church. However, I was not influencing that school culture for Christ. In fact, I was doing the opposite. In the heat of the moment, I failed to realize my influence in this physical world will shape others and lead them into the world to come. Or my ungodly influence might cause others to reject Christ. I failed to live godly and influence the community around me. In that situation, I act out following my sinful nature. I was not Christ-like, and I did not set a godly example for others. Peter tells us that our outward behavior should reflect the new life God has given us. So he reminds us to maintain pure conduct in our daily lives. Our behavior should mirror the inner transformation. And if we aim to impact this declining world, our conduct must be honorable, lovely, gracious, fair, noble, and righteous. In essence, the quality of our transformed life should be evident to those who are not yet saved. This is essential for influencing our society. Living as transformed individual will prove to those who oppose us wrong and may even lead them to Christ. Those who observe our character and the quality of our Christian life will glorify God. How so? When God moves in their hearts, they may respond and recall the powerful testimony that they witness in us. We are aliens or foreigners in this world, but we live above it. We belong in a different dimension of life. Even though we live in this world, we are not of it. There is a danger here. If we become too absorbed in our foreign identity, we can lose interest in the world we live in. Our foreignness, I'm not sure if this is a word. If it's not a word, we just make up one right now. Our foreignness from this world's system should balance by the demand for proper citizenship. That leads us to our next perspective, which is the concept of citizens. We, while we live in this world, while we live a supernatural life and are different from this world. Our life is totally different from this world. We are in this world, but not of the world. This could make us indifferent to society and neglect our duties as citizens. Peter was aware of this tendency, so he quickly added verses 14, 13 and 14, to address it, he says, for the Lord's sake, submit to all human authority, whether the king as head of the state or the officials he has appointed. For the king has sent them to punish those who do wrong and to honor those who do right. In these verses, Peter tells us how to conduct ourselves as citizens. Why? 
would we do that? When we think of ourselves as citizens of heaven and we are attacked by irresponsible, ignorant, unfounded, evil accusers, our natural default or tendency is to rise in self-defense, to retaliate, to think that we have no part of this world and ignore all this world's systems. However, God does not want such a behavior from us. In fact, he wants us to demonstrate self-restraint, virtue, and concern about our community, our city, our state, our country, and do all that we can to prevent trouble. The way to influence uh, the community and silence the critics is to obey the law of the land and respect all the authorities to command. It's simple. Submit to all human authority. This is a military term. And that means to place oneself under the command of a leader. It is an act of humility, of submission, to put oneself under the authority of another. This is a general spiritual principle for all social structures designed by God. As God's people, we are encouraged to live humbly and submit to authority even in the midst of a hostile, godless, sinful, and wicked society. What is the point behind this simple command? Why should we submit? What is the motive behind this submission? The verse says, for the Lord's sake. Hmm. It's simple. It is the way we honor God and respond to him. We submit because God demands it, and we do it in obedience to God. We know and understand that there is no authority except God, and the existing authorities are all established by God. So when we respond submissively to the existing authority, we do it for the sake of God, we, who, who instituted all authorities. The Gospel of Matthew records a conversation between Jesus and Peter about paying taxes. Peter was approached uh, by the temple's tax collectors who asked if Jesus paid the tax, paid the temple tax. Uh, Peter responded, yes. Uh, when Peter went to the house where they were meeting before he got a chance to speak about his encounter with the tax collectors, Jesus asked him, what do you think, Peter? Do kings tax their own people or the people they have conquered? That tax the people they have conquered, Peter replied. Well, then Jesus said, the citizens are free. However, we don't want to offend them. So go down to the lake and throw in a line. Open the mouth of the first fish you catch and you will find a large silver coin. Take it and pay the tax for both of us. Jesus is saying, he is the son of God, an alien of this world. And he does not have to live according to the system of this world. But as long as he is here in this world or in the country he lives in, he is a citizen. And he does not want to offend people or disobey God. So he will do whatever is required as Christians. We don't want to be known as disobedient or disrespectful of human institutions. You might be saying, Kit, what about when I feel that the government is wrong? What if the government oversteps its boundaries? 
What if the government commands me to do what God commands me not to do? If that is the case, we have a very clear word of scripture. When the government asks you to do the opposite of what God asks you to do, you have no choice but to violate the government. And you must accept and bear the punishment required for your violation. The command and the motive are clear. So why does God want us to behave this way? Peter says in verse 15, it is God's will that your honorable lives should silence those ignorant people who, take, who make foolish accusation against you. God wants us to behave this way so we may silence those ignorant people who make foolish accusation against us. Uh, many people are becoming unhappy with the church for different reasons. Some feel that the church, that church members are judgmental or divisive. Others believe the church does not reflect their cultural, political, or, theolo or theological perspectives. Some have been hurt by the church because they do not feel the church accepting them. The evangelical church gained a bad reputation or bad name in the American culture. How do we repair that reputation while holding firm to our Christian values? How do we silence the critics? The word silence means to muzzle, gag, or restrain the mouth so there is nothing to say. The will of God is that by our honorable lives, noble character, righteous conduct, and good citizenship, we gag the critics. Peter did not stop there, but continue by telling us what our attitude as citizens should be. He says, for you are free, yet you are God's slaves, so don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. And this is an impactful statement by Peter, for you are free as believers. You are liberated from the world, sin, Satan, and condemnation. Your freedom in Christ comes from being redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus, setting you free from bondage. Peter emphasizes that this freedom should not be misused as an excuse for wrongdoing. As Christians, we should not abuse our freedom to, the, to disobey God's law. Instead, our freedom grants us the ability to do what is right and to serve God willingly. Uh, Peter sums it all up with four application points. He says... Respect everyone, love the family of believers, fear God, and respect the king. Peter reminds us to first respect everyone because everyone was created in God's image. Even those who are Republican or who are Democrat, or those who put up a yard sign you might not like. Respect everyone, regardless of their authority level or status in society. But that does not mean you have to like everything they do. The next thing Peter tells us is love the family of believers. Those who accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. You, me, the church. We should love all believers, even if someone at hometown votes differently than you or has a different political views than you. Then Peter tells us to fear God. For the unbeliever, 
The fear of God is the fear of judgment of God or eternal death. And for the believer, the fear of God is the reverence, is the reverence of God. We have no reason to be afraid of God because we have his promise that nothing can separate us from his love and he will not leave us or forsake us. The fear of God means having a reverence for him that significantly impacts how we live. The fear of God is respecting him, obeying him, submitting to his word and worshiping him in awe. Peter completes this section with respect for the king. And last week, uh, Pastor Spencer talked about the cruelty of the government that Peter lived under. As a reminder, the Roman Empire was the type of government in which the emperor held absolute power. Uh, that means uh, there was no democracy. The government was not of the people, for the people, or by the people. And Peter's still saying that we should show respect for whoever the ruling source of authority is, even if the king becomes Kamala Harris or Donald Trump. As we navigate life in this world and light of the world to come, we are called to influence society with integrity while balancing our roles as both foreigners and citizens in this world. God calls us to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for us. Jesus left us an example. And, and, and Peter want to tell us about this example. And he tells, actually tells about it in 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verses 23 to 25, that Jesus did not retaliate when insulted or threatened revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. He carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. <laughs> when Jesus was killed by the Jewish and the Roman authorities, he lived under their unjust and unrighteous rule for his life. However, he did not attack them or led a civil disobedience. Instead, he only spoke of the kingdom of God. He called sinners to repent and come to him to enter his kingdom. He kept entrusting himself to God, the one who judges righteously, who is sovereign and has the whole entire world in his control. So remember, we are called to influence society with integrity while balancing our roles as both foreigners and citizens in this world. Let's pray. God, we thank you. And thank you, God, for who you are. Thank you for giving us this example, how to live within the two worlds. God, we pray for your grace. We ask for your mercy. We ask for strength. We ask for courage. We ask that your Holy Spirit will empower us to live in this life as we're looking forward to the next life to come. In Jesus' name, amen.